Good afternoon. It's so good to see you folks here today and uh, just a very sacred time as we're here to celebrate uh, a life that was well lived for Christ and for His purposes. And uh, we know that Scripture says that precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of one of His saints. And, uh, and so we are here to celebrate Louisa's life today. I'd like to just, my name's Stan Welch. I uh, am one of Louisa's adopted sons. I'm, I don't suspect I'm the only one. But uh, I want to start off just reading, reading a bio about Louise. Emma Louise Wolfe of Roseburg, Oregon, left her home on February 7, 2022, for her heavenly home. She is survived by her children, Barbara Louise Talbot, Patricia Patty Lois Ottinger, Dolores Lori Lyle Lashbrook, and Theola Teddy Lawana Flora. She was preceded in death by her husband, Robert Bob, Nicholson Wolf and her son Clifford Lynn Wolf. She met the love of her life, Bob, at a Servicemen's Center in Santa Rosa, California, and they were married May 28, 1945. When Bob was released from the Navy after World War II, he took her home to Easton, Pennsylvania. Uh, daughter Barbara was born across the river in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. And Louise uh, followed Bob to Sioux Falls, South Dakota for college under the GI Bill. And that's where Patty and Lori were born. After college, Louise followed Bob to Portland, Oregon for seminary. And that's where their son Clifford was born. They started their ministry there with Bob preaching. After seminary, they moved to Seattle, Washington, where they started their first church. Teddy was born there. They continued their work starting churches for the American Baptist Association as church planners in Salem, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, and Bishop, California. And Louise was busy taking care of five children, being a homemaker, help meet to Bob, going on house calls with Bob, and always a hostess welcoming people into their home. Bob took his first pastorate with the Conservative Baptist Association in Apple Valley, California, and then in Astoria, Oregon. And while they were in Apple Valley, they met missionaries from Naples, Italy, Al and Ruth Rohrbach, Rohrbar, bar, right? Rohrbach, thank you, yes. Al would greet them with, when are you coming to Italy to help us? And Bob would respond with, when, it, when the Italians speak English. <laughs> After their children were gone, Al asked the question again and got the same response. And Al suggested that they serve at the Servicemen's Center in Naples, Italy. And that, that was their next adventure. They spent eight years there where Louise was a cook, a mother, grandmother, and counselor to many service people. They also pastored an English-speaking church in Naples. When they came home, they took a pastorate in L.A. and then Sedona, Arizona, and their final pastorate before retiring was Sweet Home, Oregon. They retired to Roseburg and did intern preaching or interim preaching for churches that were without a pastor. Their daughters, Barbara, Patty, and Lori, helped them when needed. I know what that's like. I was a PK, yeah. When needed until they needed more help. And their kids moved them to a fifth-wheel trailer where Patty and her husband, Dwayne, could care for them. After Bob died, Patty moved Louise into her home. And we are so grateful for Patty and Dwayne's care of Louise. I'm going to have uh, Pastor Dave York is going to come up and lead us in prayer. Uh, we'll have a song that we'll all sing together and, and a short message. And uh, we'll just share some memories also of Louise's life. Dave. Well, let's pray together. Father, what a privilege it is that we got the privilege to know Louise. What a quintessential Christian woman and a faithful pastor's wife and Lord a faithful child of God and we come today to celebrate her life because she lived for you and she loved her family and she loved the church and she loved Christian people and we thank you that as we celebrate the the death of one of your children we're really celebrating your faithfulness to them as well and so we thank you let this time Lord honor you and let it be a blessing to the family, and let it honor Louise as well. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up if you can and uh, join us as we just uh, sing some worship to our Lord this morning, this afternoon.
When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows rose, whatever my lot, Thou hast taught me to say. mentioned earlier, uh, we're here to celebrate a life, uh, and a life that's lived for Christ is certainly a life to be celebrated, right? We're here to celebrate the, the gift of Emma Louise Wolf, and many of you know Louise as your mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, friend. She was known and loved as a daughter, a pastor's wife, a hostess, a church member, and uh, I knew Louise as my sister in Christ and as my adopted mom, as I mentioned earlier. And I, I do suspect, even though I like to think I'm her favorite son, uh, I suspect I'm probably a, among many, many others, especially in their time in the service. She probably had adopted many, many sons, and, uh, but I'm grateful to be one of them. She was a face that lit up uh, when our eyes would meet, and, and she was also a prayer warrior not just for Mel and for me, but for our, our girls too. And if any of you here have had teenage daughters, you can know just how invaluable that is to have a prayer warrior in your corner. Uh, and when Louise was too weak to walk and, uh, and her health was failing, it, it didn't lessen the fact that we had a prayer warrior in our corner. And we were just so grateful 
uh, that that was the case. Our last visit with Louise, as we were leaving, Mel and I were there, and uh, she pulled Mel off to the side, and I kind of saw it out of the corner of my eye, and she, I saw her motion at me and, and say something in her ear. I didn't know what she said. It, it appeared to be a very sweet moment. And uh, it wasn't until later that Mel told me what she actually had said, and Louise had said, looks like you fattened him up. <laughs> <laughs> And those were among some of her last words to us. <laughs> Looks like you fattened him up. Uh, <laughs> when I think of all the joy and the love and uh, the smiles that Louise brought into our lives, uh, it's, it's bittersweet, isn't it? And there's a sense of loss. And I'm sure that's true of all of us here today as we consider what roles that she played in each of our lives. When we lose someone we love... Uh, who's loved us so well and left an imprint on us, there's a vacancy, a vacancy of a mother and of a friend and a prayer warrior. And, and where there's loss, there's grief. And this is connected to what the Bible calls the sting of death. Because of death, we grieve. Psalm 116, 15, as I said at the top of the service, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of of his saints, and, and Louise's death is precious to the Lord. And although there's sweetness in celebrating a life lived for Christ, I don't know that the first word that we would choose in describing death in this moment would be precious. In a very real sense, we feel the results of death, don't we? And the pain that death can sometimes bring can overshadow and skew our view of the preciousness of death as seen from God's perspective, because quite frankly, it hurts to lose someone that we care about. And God's word tells us that, that he's put eternity into an, our hearts, so, and because of that, we know instinctively that there's something better than death. We know. And death and the topic of death can evoke some very strong emotions. Well, it's encouraging to me to know that Jesus also had very strong feelings toward death. After all, when his good friend Lazarus died, he wept. And even though Jesus knew that he would soon be raising Lazarus from the dead, he still hurt for those who were grieving, and he wept. He saw the impact and the effects of death, the distortion of his creation that he loved so dearly, and it moved him to tears. Jesus knew that the wages of sin is death and that all mankind is subject to death because we've all sinned. And Jesus knew that through one man centered into the world and, that, and through that death, uh, death came through that sin. And so death passed on to all of us because we've all sinned. So Jesus wept. Tears and, and even anger are the right response to the evil of death. In times like these, tears may come. And, and often when they do come, what do we do? We, we apologize because as if we've done something wrong. But tears are actually appropriate. And in fact, I would say uh, they're, not, they're more than appropriate that they are a gift from God. And I'm so glad that, as Psalm 34 says, the, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. So we are to grieve, but, but the Apostle Paul tells us we're not to grieve as those who have no hope. And Paul explains this in 1 Thessalonians 4, starting, starting with verse 13. He says, But we do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. So Paul is saying in this passage, we shouldn't grieve like the rest of the world who has no hope. He's not saying don't grieve. You notice that? He's actually communicating a, a double negative here. He, what he's actually saying is, when you grieve, I want your grief to be filled with hope. Believers and followers of Christ are to fully grieve and to fully grieve with hope. But how? How can we be hope-filled in the middle of our grief? On a day like today or, or other days when we experience loss. 
we must look at what this hope is based upon. This hope is for the believer, the follower of Christ, those who have trusted in him for salvation. And that's why Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed brothers. He's talking to brothers in Christ. In uh, verse 14, he says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Christ, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Beloved friends and family here today, I am so glad that Christ's relationship to death didn't end with him only weeping at its effects. How about you? He went so far beyond that, conquering, overcoming, and annihilating death. Christ made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human form, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And on that cross, he paid the penalty for sin, and then he went, on, went to the grave, and three days later, he rose as a victor over death, bre- breaking the power of sin. And then God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is how we stand here today and sing, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's well. Those lyrics would otherwise be absurd if Christ had not laid down his life as the only acceptable sacrifice for our sin. And that hope is rooted in and founded upon the resurrection of Christ from the grave. Because of this overcoming power to death, it's not only afforded to Christ, but now it's afforded in all who trust in him for salvation. 1 Corinthians 15 explains this, For as death came through one man, the resurrection of the dead has also come through one man. Just as in Adam we all die, in Christ we all will be made alive. And it goes on in that passage to say that, that someday the last enemy to be destroyed is going to be death. We look forward to that day, don't we? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I think that was actually inscribed over the nursery, where I, my first nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> uh, but this is talking about a different kind of being changed here. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Retro mod, right, Dave? Retro mod, yeah. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass this saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is, is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Be encouraged. I know I'm reading a lot of scripture here today, uh, but honestly, I can't give you hope apart from the, God's word. We depend on him on days like this, and he's such... Uh, a good communicator and letting us know how we can have that hope. And then, so back in 1 Thessalonians, Paul, in this encouraging passage, goes on to say, For this we declare to you a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, in the sound of a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Friends, as sure as I'm standing here today, this is going to happen. Do you believe this? It says, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So though we grieve and, and we may weep, it is well, as we sang. And Lord, haste that day when my faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it's well with my soul. 
Spiritual matters were important to Louise, and they should be to all of us. She's no longer here, as will be true of each of us someday. I know when my, my dad passed away, he was a believer, a follower of Christ, and I just remember how his physical absence, the reality of his physical absence, helped fortify and build my faith. It was a good thing, had good results, because I had to consider he's not here. There was a physical absence. He's not here. Where is he? Louise is no longer here. Where is she? That should really matter to each one of us here today. And I can say, based on the authority of Scripture, that we should all envy Louise today because Scripture tells us that Louise is with her Lord, that her faith has become sight. She is no longer in the presence of sin or pain. She's in the presence of Christ, her Lord, who took her sin upon himself and placed his righteousness on her. She's with her Savior. And she will always be with her Lord. And Paul ends this passage in 1 Thessalonians with this wonderful exhortation, exhortation that I just, I love this. I don't know why it just thrills me, but it does. It says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another. So I ask you, are you encouraged by these words today? If you hear everything that I've been saying or what God's word says and they bring you little comfort, I, I have to ask you then, what is your hope placed in? Your money? Is it a relationship? Is it some other form of security? Or something that won't last into eternity? Because when you face death, these things will have no power to give you eternal life. These things cannot offer eternal life. Only Christ in Christ is our eternal life. We could never enter into the presence of a holy God on our own merit. And I know Louise would want me to share this with you today. We could never enter into the presence of a holy God on our own merit. We've sinned and we deserve judgment for that sin. And it's only Christ's perfect sacrifice that was sufficient to pay for our sin. And we must turn from our sin and trust in his sacrifice for salvation and eternal life. We, we need to agree with God on these matters today. And I, as I said earlier, I am just so grateful that God is good at communicating in his word and warning us and giving us all the tools we need. And, and uh, he gives us a heads up and he knows that each of us are going to face death. It's just a reality. I work at, at a hospice and I talk to people every day who have lost family members. And uh, some have this eternal hope and some do not. But we need not grieve like the hopeless world grieves. Why? Because we believe that Jesus died and he rose again. And if he can do that, he can and he will do the same for those who trust in him. Amen? Amen. So let's encourage each other with these words, not just today or days like today, but every day until we breathe our last or until he, until he takes us home as he does, as he has Louise. And we look forward to being with her again someday. Let's pray. God, we do just thank you so much for the truth of your word, Father. I pray that you will just increase our faith as we're here to celebrate Louise's life. God, uh, that we know that a life lived for you is not a wasted life. It's filled with purpose, Lord. It's pointing to you. It's pointing others to you. And so today, Father, I know that that was Louise's heart, and we do the same. We look to you the author and finisher of our faith. And I, I pray, Father, that just as uh, we go through our days and weeks and we have those waves of loss that come over, that maybe catch us by surprise, Father, I pray that you will just be there to minister to each and every heart and just remind us of this great hope that we have in you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll have a slideshow now.
Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him I'm Barbara, their oldest daughter, and my siblings picked me <laughs> to talk about mom. She was beautiful, wasn't she? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Our mom, Emma Louise Bogart Wolf, was born in Oakley, Kansas. Her parents were chicken farmers, and mom talked about chicken, cooking chicken every lunchtime for the workers. She did not like eating chicken, and that might be the reason. <laughs> <laughs> they had an outhouse, outdoor plumbing in Kansas. 
During the Great Depression, her family did what a lot of Midwest families did, and they migrated to the Golden State of California, to the city of Santa Rosa. Her dad worked at many different odd jobs. He was a painter. He raised parakeets. Um, he drew pit. He, he did art all over their fences, beautiful flowers. He crocheted. During the war, she and her sister would spend time where the boys were, at a serviceman center there in town, and that is where she met our dad. He was stationed nearby, and that is where my dad became a Christian. And mom was raised by a godly mother, but at that time, grandpa was not a believer. He accepted Christ when I was in my early teens. My dad was bold, but my mom was not. We've been told that dad saw mom outside the center crying and went to ask her if she was okay. And she said her fiance was in the center flirting with all the girls. My dad told her, go in, give him back his ring, and I'll take over from here. <laughs> <laughs> they were married three months later, and my boys love that story. <laughs> <laughs> After the war, my dad was released from duty and took her home to Pennsylvania where his parents lived, and I was born across the river in New Jersey. That fall, we moved to, San, uh, to Sioux Falls for college, and my dad went under the GI Bill, and stories are that our first home was a half of a railroad car with cardboard walls and crepe paper curtains, and it was much later when they realized what a flower, uh, fire trap that was. <clears throat> um, Patty and Lori were born in Sioux, in Sioux Falls. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Mom talked about it being so cold, and at least once they ran out of coal for three days, and she had to entertain three little ones in bed. We're about a year and a half apart, each of us. So, yeah, we were pretty young. Um, trying to keep us covered and keep us warm. Our dad saw some coal on the side of the road and bagged it up and brought it home. And he felt so guilty about it over the years that later she, he sent money and a letter to the city telling them what he had done and apologizing. And uh, he made the newspaper. <laughs> it was so shocking. <laughs> Uh, the next adventure was seminary. They had decided on missions, and they headed to Petl Portland, Oregon, where Clifford was born, and they let, later lost a son at birth, Timothy. Dad started working part-time with the Fuller Brush Company to help support his growing family. He also started filling in pulpits for churches that were without a pastor. Mom was a farmer's daughter, as I said, so she canned vegetables and fruit, anything she could get, made her own bread, sewed, made a lot of our clothes by hand at first and then with a Singer sewing machine. She frequently would dress us alike, as you saw. She made some of her own concoctions for coughing, such as cooked onion and sugar. It actually tastes pretty good, you guys. <laughs> um, she loved sweets, so she made homemade cinnamon rolls, pies, cookies, donuts, etc., cetera, uh, which we all enjoyed also. Money was always tight, so she and Dad made sure that we ate first, and if there was anything left over, they got to eat. Daddy said they missed a few meals when they were young. <laughs> My mom was a great cook, too, and one of her favorite was date bread at Christmas time, which she sent to all the relatives. And even this November, I was seeing on Facebook, does anybody have Aunt Louise's date bread recipe? She also kept her hands busy most of the time. She crocheted a lot and knitted. But there's many family members here that got received blankets that she had crocheted. Our home was always open to people, and it was not unusual to be told to throw another potato or two into the pot for dinner to make it stretch. 
mom served peanut butter and any other sandwich he had to men who frequently came to our door asking for food. They seemed to know where they could get it. And she and dad even took in a girlfriend of mine who was in foster care and being abused by her foster dad. And also a teen boy for a few days uh, stayed in our house while my dad counseled his parents. He had accepted the Lord and his family kicked him out. So what I'm trying to say is their door was always open to anybody. After seminary, mom and dad became home missionaries, church planters for the Baptist Association. And our first church plant was in Seattle where Teddy was born. We had a huge, we felt it was a mansion of a house, had sweeping staircases coming down, and that was the church and our home. The church men blocked off that stairway sad waste of a stairway and our main living quarters was upstairs and then the main floor was church and the basement was Sunday school rooms. Sorry. <clears throat> the church people of course didn't have very much money. It was a few uh, people who wanted a Baptist church, but they gave whatever they could. They gave crops, canned goods, meat from their farms, milk from their cows, and dad continued working part-time with Fuller Brush. It had to be hard on my mom to have five little ones, seven years apart in age, and having church at our house, being a hostess, doing visitation with our dad. They lost another child before birth, and got, mom got an infection and had to have a hysterectomy in the early 30s. In those days, there were no hormones to help her out, and she had a nervous breakdown and could no, do nothing but cry. The doctor wanted her to be institutionalized, but dad was determined that we would care for her, and we did. It took a few years, but she persevered, and so did we. As soon as church was able to start supporting a pastor, it was time to move on. Our final church plant was in Bishop, California. We started out in a tiny hotel strip a member owned. The older kids in one room and the parents and babies next door. We then got a two bedroom rental house and Clifford got the privilege of sleeping in the closet. <laughs> and that is where my girlfriend joined our family. So now we had six kids. It was in Bishop that our family met missionaries to Italy, Al and Ruth Rohrbaugh, and they became fast friends for our family. We loved them, and every time they were home, like, like you told us, <laughs> they, they would give a call for Dad to join them in Italy, and Dad would respond when the Italians speak English. The next adventure was a pastorate in an already formed small church in Apple Valley where most of us graduated from high school and, or either got married or went on to college. The last early, uh, pastorate was in Astoria, Oregon, and that's where Teddy graduated. At each church, we made friends, and of course, even though mom is naturally an introvert and uncomfortable with new people, once she gets to know someone, she loves them, and she never lets them go. She kept in touch with people via letter from all the churches that they had attended and served in. Al and Ruth visited once again after we were all grown and asked the same question, got the same response, and then told our parents about the Servicemen Center in Naples, Italy that needed a pastor. Because of mom's correspondence, it only took a few months for them to raise support, and that is really unusual. There, my mom was in a very uncomfortable situation because she's the cook every single night for who knows how many people. It depends on what ships come in and how many people show up at the center. That would that would be too much for me. She was also mother, grandmother, counselor to many people from many countries. And so she has sons, you, 
but she has many sons all over the place. Um, and many of them stayed friends with her till her death. When, we came home, when they came home to retire, they filled in for churches that were without a pastor as a substitute until one was hired and then took on a final pastorate. It was actually in Lebanon, Oregon. And mom had the added job there of caring for first my dad's mother and then her own. After retiring for sure, we moved them to Roseburg until they couldn't care for themselves, then to a fifth wheel on Patty's farm, the Ottinger farm, where Patty and Duane would assist. Then when my dad passed away into Patty's house, we are forever grateful for the care they gave our parents. Mom is, was, greatly loved by her family and many other people. It is especially hard when you live into your 90s because most of your friends have gone before. She lost my dad. She lost my brother and his wife. Tough to lose your kids. We also want to thank the church for loving on our mom. It meant so much to her to know that she was loved and valued. We appreciate your many thoughtful gifts towards her. Thank you. Oh. I'll take that back from you. Barbara, thank you. That was fantastic. I could tell how nervous you were by shaking. Your hands were shaking a little bit there, but you did great. Yeah, it's okay. You did great. Yeah, you did great. Um, we can tell you that as a church that your mom attended, she made it really easy to, to love on her. Oh, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I really do. I wasn't an adopted son, but I can tell you I was an adopted pastor who she kissed on quite a bit. And uh, I didn't mind that one bit. My, my uh, youngest son, Caleb, is 12. He'll be 13 in March. And um, he, he said, is today the day that we're going to celebrate Miss Louise, the lady that would always give me a kiss? I said, yes, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, so he remembers her. Listen, we're, we're freshly aware is that we've, we've shared a few things <clears throat> and some stories, but we probably think that some of you might have some things you'd like to share, maybe a word of encouragement, just a memory, something that just really affected you um, about Louise's life, and we want to give you the opportunity. I'll bring you the microphone so you don't have to come up front. Uh, so if you'd like to do that, just stand up and, uh, or just wave your hand, and I'll, I'll come and find you. Bueller? I'm just kidding. Yeah, because you don't know that one. Anybody? Okay, great. Stan, you guys are up. I know a lot of times that uh, folks have microphone fright they think they're going to get zapped or something I'm not sure but it, as you guys are just enjoying some fellowship time there will be some fellowship time in a little bit uh, share some stories share some memories how you know Louise and uh, and I can't tell you how many things that I hear family members say I never knew that about mom or I never knew that about because people are sharing and uh, there's different connections and it's it's a real sweet opportunity to just really celebrate that life all right, let's stand up and uh, we'll sing the song and, uh, and then we'll close in prayer at the end. This is one everybody knows. And then uh, Dave, Pastor Dave, will come up and close us in prayer. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. blind but now I see twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my 
fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I days. Well, the family wants to invite you to a reception that'll be um, when, just directly when you came in. As you notice, in between the buildings, there's like a gate area that's all open for you to go into that building. There's be food there available for you, and we're grateful that you came, so let's pray together. Father, thank you for the life of Louise. What a gift. Uh, and thank you, Lord, that as we celebrated her today, it's so obvious that you, you were involved from beginning to end. And thank you that right now, Lord, she is celebrating with you and we, her family, that though we grieve, we do not grieve without hope. And we thank you. Lord, we ask you to bless our time as we fellowship together, as we talk together and celebrate more of Louise's life and just think about the joy she brought to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming.